Just about 24 hours after Texas enacted an incredibly restrictive abortion law, the Supreme Court rejected a request from abortion providers to block it from staying on the books, and that's caused a flurry of backlash today. The Supreme Court's conservative majority made their ruling in a one-paragraph unsigned order just a little before midnight last night. They admitted the, that although the providers had raised serious questions regarding the constitutionality of the Texas law, it simply wasn't enough for the court to block it in the end. President Biden responded to the Supreme Court's decision today, saying it will unleash unconstitutional chaos. He is vowing to give a hold of government response to the law. And Speaker Pelosi said the House will vote later this month on legislation that will protect a woman's right to an abortion anywhere in the U.S. in response to the Supreme Court's decision on the Texas law. Joining me now to discuss is constitutional lawyer and senior editor of law and policy for the Rewired News Group, Imani Gandhi. So, Imani, um, make sense of the court's decision in this case. It seems like they were saying, we're not saying that this is constitutional, but on procedural grounds, we cannot block it. Does this give you any hope that the court will eventually find this law to be unconstitutional? No, not really. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that Texas passed an unconstitutional pre-viability abortion ban under decades of the court's precedent. These types of bans are unconstitutional. No federal court in the country has ever upheld one of these bans. So the fact that Texas enacted this ban and then and then enacted this this odd regime wherein they are they're sort of deputizing anybody in the country to enforce this law on their behalf and in their stead thereby insulating themselves from a challenge to this lawsuit the fact that texas did that sort of procedural jiggery pokery is what i've been calling it should not mean that the supreme court just looks at what they've done and throws their hands up and say you know we don't know what to do we're just going to let the law stay on the books while the, the, the litigation goes on in the lower courts. The proper thing for them to have done when faced with this very odd scheme would have been to say, wait a minute, we're gonna pause the law, we're gonna maintain the status quo so that pregnant people still have access to abortion while this litigation goes on in the district court and perhaps in the Fifth Circuit. So the fact that they didn't do that is a very, very strong signal that the court is ready to overturn Roe versus Wade either outright or what they did last night, which was to essentially nullify it in Texas, thereby signaling to about 24 or 25 other states that are extremely hostile to abortion, that it's okay for them to not only pass these unconstitutional gestational bans, but then to also use the same public enforcement, or excuse me, this private enforcement mechanism that Texas has used. And Florida has already announced that they're planning on doing it, and I expect that we are going to see a lot of states trying this. So, you know, is it your understanding or your belief that there will be copycat uh, uh, legislation, as you just described, and that we could end up with a country where half the states in the country are states in which a woman effectively has no right to an abortion uh, 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 where uh, half the country effectively has an overturning of Roe v. Wade. Absolutely. There are currently, I think, maybe 24 or 25 states that have these so-called trigger bans, which means that as soon as Roe v. Wade is overturned, then abortion is automatically illegal and criminalized in that state. So those are the states that are going to start looking to Texas and what Texas did and start copycatting that. We're talking places like Florida, Arkansas, both Dakotas, both Carolinas. I mean, there are very few sort of pockets of abortion access left. And this law is going to further winnow the, the access that's available to pregnant people. So it's, it's actually a really, it's a really outrageous thing that the court did, and it's an outrageous framework for a law to say that we are not going to, we public officials are not going to enforce this law because we know that as soon as someone takes us to court and challenges this law, it's going to be immediately blocked. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to do something so that we can make sure that the law goes into effect. And so while the, the litigation is ongoing in the lower courts, this law is in effect. And that could be six months to a year, even if by some stroke of luck, the Fifth Circuit upholds a striking down of this law. By that point, we are probably pushing up against the point at which the court is going to hear the Mississippi case, which is Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. And that's a 15 week ban. And so, you know, that's the case that's sitting on the court's docket. We haven't yet heard when they're going to hear oral arguments on that case. But, you know, that was the case that I suspected was going to be the end of Roe. I did not expect that the court was going to basically nullify Roe via shadow docket on a Wednesday night. That's just outrageous to me. Are, are the impacts or burdens and pain of this ruling falling kind of equally on all women? Or are they disproportionately falling on black women and women of color? Oh, absolutely. It's disproportionately affecting black women, you know, indigenous women, people of color generally, trans people. I mean, we have to remember that it's not just women that are capable of becoming pregnant. Trans men are, non-binary um, people are. And so those are the sort of vulnerable people that this law is going to affect. And we also have to remember that a lot of people who are pregnant already have children. So this law is going to force them to go through extreme measures in order to, to, to access abortion, including trying to find child care for the children that they have, trying to get flights and hotel rooms to go to far flung places. And it's, 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 I can't stress enough how difficult it's going to be for vulnerable people, people of color and low income people to access abortion. It's already been difficult. It's going to get, you know, exponentially more difficult. Imani Gandhi, thank you so much for coming in and talking about to us about this really important story.